Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Uh, Rob crossed the Atlantic. He is stateside for our weekly chat on geopolitics and markets. Uh, I thought this was a particularly good episode. We talk about uh, some market developments before turning to some strange news about coal prices and coal supply in China and what that might mean for global energy prices. Uh, We address the one-year anniversary, for lack of a better word, of the Russian war in Ukraine, and then talk a little bit about what strategic ambiguity means in the context of the Philippines um, and Taiwan and U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific, and and close with some lessons that Japan teaches us from a geopolitical perspective. As always, you can write to me at jacob at cognitive.investments. You can send me thoughts about the podcast, or you can ask me what we do at CI in terms of investing for clients. You can even ask about the geopolitical consulting services we offer, if that is up your alley. Um, If you haven't yet, if you haven't yet left us a review of the podcast, that would be awesome. It's immensely helpful for us. Um, But otherwise, that's about all I got. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Rob, nice to have you back in the United States, man. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. It's good to be back. I had a um, a big bagel breakfast sandwich this morning, which is something that you really can't get over in France with bacon. Oh man, <laughs> it's funny the things that you miss. There are no bagels in France. Uh, they do them, but they're not very good. Okay, well, R- Rob Certainly is broadcasting from New York City. Them. It's it's the one place where you can actually get real. Well, we have some decent bagels down here in New Orleans. There's some weird food transfer stuff between New Orleans and, and New York City, but this is not the time to do my Geopolitics of Food podcast. Gordon Ramsay, if you're listening, would love to have you on to do Geopolitics of Food. That would be like my dream over here. Um, but let's just start, Rob. Uh, we don't like to take too many victory laps on this podcast, but I do think you should just give us a minute or two about you know kind of where we're at in the market right now and how some of the things that you talked about in the last couple of weeks appear to be playing out. Yeah, so just an update, because a few weeks ago we were talking about how um, the euro has been, you know, going up, 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 that expectations were that the U.S. economy is slowing down, that U.S. rates are going to come down, and it's just a matter of when and not if. And um, we made the point that we were seeing signs that the U.S. labor market was tightening again, that U.S. growth was re-accelerating. And that when you look at Europe rebounding from expectations of the worst, when you look at China reopening, that the ultimate outcome of that is that it's going to help flow into U.S. growth as well. And that's what we've essentially seen happen. There's been a revision of people's expectations over the last few weeks. And now the consensus view is much more bullish on the U.S. in terms of economic growth and in terms of inflation, especially labor-based inflation. And what you've seen as a result is, like we said, the dollar is seeing a resurgence and the euro, after briefly poking its head above 110 to the dollar, got slammed and has since been starting to move back in the other direction. So now we're at 1.06 and change. I would expect that to follow through pretty significantly in the in the coming months so that's a big trend change that listeners should be aware of if you're not paying close attention to markets because it's a big deal how long do you think this shift lasts for is it is it sort of a a month issue do you think this is the story of the rest of the year like how, how should we think about the timing in markets it's always cause and effect so and we've talked about this notion of you know, the bathtub with the water chopping around and you have outsized, you know, uh, uh, forces creating outsized effects in the opposite direction. 
So what we've just seen is, you know, a move in in one direction. The U.S. is reaccelerating. The whole the whole globe is reaccelerating in its growth. So there's going to be an effect to that, and the effect is that monetary policy in the U.S. is going to be much tighter than people expected. Either that means rates are going to go higher or that they're going to stay higher for longer or some combination of those two things. So what is the what is the result of that? Well, you know, ultimately, if rates get tight enough, if monetary policy gets tight enough, then you are going to see that slowdown, that significant sort of maybe you don't want to use the R word in this in this context, but certainly a moderation of growth in the US that would create those sort of conditions. So um, I think we've got a ways to go before we get there. The narrative is just starting to turn again in the direction that we identified. So this probably has some legs. At least several months would be my guess before you really start to see markets pricing in the other side. As a back way to sort of get into what we wanted to talk about next, I, I just want to ask what you think that means in particular for energy prices, because as we're sitting here today, natural gas prices have completely collapsed. Um, oil is up today, but you know it's hanging out around in that 70 to 78 sort of range, um, despite Russia saying it's going to cut back exports. I think that's more for politics and things like that. But also despite China, you know, reports that there might have record imports this year. Um, and I, I know you've been sort of looking at, at oil, um, a little bit. Um, so what, like, how, how do you start thinking about how, what you're talking about is going to affect energy prices? Because I would think that if that narrative takes hold, um, we should see a rebound in oil prices and we should see maybe even a rebound in natural gas. But right now, I mean, the, the market seems, and especially with natural gas, there's, it's, you know, there, it seems oversupplied. It seems like, uh, People are trying to gird themselves for low energy prices for the rest of this year, which considering the narrative um, from people last year is remarkable in and of its own right. Well, well, you have to be a little careful distinguishing between the different commodities because yeah. natural gas has a huge weather element to it, which of course is a wild card and has been remarkably mild this winter. Um, who knows what the summer will bring? Uh, but yeah, all else equal, um, demand is improving or has been improving and now people are sort of recognizing that um, supply is another question entirely you know whether Libya is going to be able to get to you know two million barrels per day or you, you know those are those are all things you could take independently but um, certainly on on the demand side you are seeing an improvement the market appears to be sort of, not reflecting that so much, um, but it's hard to piece out how much of that is other factors versus them questioning the demand surge. Yeah. Well, that, that lets us back into um, a really interesting article in Bloomberg, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the author, but the title of the column is China's Coal Mining Boom is Running on Fumes. Um, and I, I think everybody is talking about the one-year anniversary of the anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine war. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but in some ways, I think this article was the most interesting thing that came across both of our desks today, Rob, because it's not just oil and gas. If you're, if you're getting more energy demand, coal is a big one, especially if you're India or if you're China, which still gets something like 70% of its, of its electricity from coal. And what's so interesting about the data is that Chinese stockpiles of coal actually seem to be quite high, and yet spot coal prices are also very high. You're getting this sort of situation where China has a lot of coal, but the price of coal is also going up. And if you put that in context of, you know, Pakistan last week, this was in the SITREP. I don't think we talked about it in the podcast. Pakistan saying no more LNG for us, just coal going forward because we literally can't get any LNG. We can't compete with the Europeans. The Indian government coming out today, um, or not today, I should say, this week and talking about oh, we're going to have really high electricity consumption. We need to start hoarding coal in order to get through a very hot summer. Um, also, India today, I believe, said they're uh, they're putting out 2 million tons of wheat to cool wheat prices in India. That's also sort of a little aside there. We might get to wheat in sort of a second. Uh, but tell me what, what stuck out to you about that um, report about China coal, because it, it definitely made me think for a second. Because coal prices, you know, if you go back to 2019, 2020 and read the IEA and the EIA and 
you know, almost any energy publication you could get. It was coal is dead, coal is never coming back, ESG forever, rah, rah. And now coal, it's it's record prices, it's more demand. It's there's a lot of interesting things going on in the coal market in general and specifically this week in China. Yeah, I thought it was a very, very interesting article. And really the thesis is a little bit speculative, but if I understand the thesis, the writer was pointing out that okay, you have this weird a uh, paradox where production of coal is through the roof in China, inventories of coal are piling up everywhere, and yet the spot price of coal is super high. So how do you account for that? And his thesis is that um, the quality of the coal coming out of the ground is degrading, that China has you know, essentially produced a lot of the easier to get higher quality coal and now they're getting into layer upon layer of lower energy density or lower quality coal. And that that would account for the fact that they're using more and more, but the electricity generation is not really growing. Um, so w- what, this, uh, what this writer says is that, um, first of all, the inflation of coal production has been very high in China. So it's costing a lot more to get coal out of the grounds than it was previously. And all of the big producers lock in their coal consumption with long-term contracts with the big miners. And what you're seeing is that they're supplementing, they're topping up that coal uh, that they've contracted to take with purchases in the spot market. Um, And one potential reason for that is that the coal that they've contracted for, you know, basically ain't getting the job done. It's not efficient enough to produce the electricity demanded and that they have to supplement it um, at very high prices. Um, So, you know, I guess I'll hand it off to you, but my impression of that is that this is a very big deal if that thesis is correct because, you know, passing, passing the peak in terms of quality and, and cost of extraction is is a major milestone in any energy transition. And it's it's funny, I was doing a little bit of background research and I found there was a, um, a pretty well-cited article back in 2007 from two Chinese academics and they apply the um, sort of the standard way, I forget the name of, is it, this is this is really stupid, the Hubbard curve. Oh yeah. Uh, there was a yeah yeah. I didn't want to screw that one up. Uh, they apply the Hubbard curve. This is back in 2007, so 15 years ago, to analyzing Chinese coal production, and they basically say, look, it works like a bell curve. You work your way up, and then things you know decline as the quality you know eases off and cost to produce goes up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they said, well, we expect coal production to peak somewhere between 2025 and 2030 based on mm. based on this. So it's actually kind of interesting because based on this article coming out today in 2023, like that's looking like a potential scenario, in which case kudos to those guys. Yeah. Well, first of all, the name of the author is David Fickling, and we'll link to the the article in the show notes here. I, I went and Googled it while you were talking because I hate it when people steal my ideas and don't cite. So there you go, David. <laughs> Cheers on you. Um, and it's funny when you stumble across a paper like what you're talking about. Like I remember um, when, the COVID, when COVID-19 was still an epidemic in China, it wasn't a pandemic yet. I found, um, I think it was an NI an NIS paper. I'll, I'll have to go back and get the link. Um, but which basically was predicting more diseases that jump from animals to humans in the decades ahead and gave a couple of hotspots on the map where they thought the chance of, of jumping was most high. And Wuhan's right in the center of one of their heat maps. Um, so the, the, the one side of that is that COVID wasn't a black swan. Like there was a paper out there that predicted exactly what was going to happen. But to find that paper, number one, you would have first had to find it. So you probably have to wade through a, th- a thousand other different papers. And then you have to have the foresight to say, okay, this is the paper that's going to be right there. Um, so it's it's cool that these guys seem to be right on, on target there. But if you compare that to probably the sheer amount of speculation that's been out there about 
you know, China's energy sector and uh, green transition and all this other stuff, it, it goes to show you that the real challenge of analysis today is actually not finding information. It's sifting through so much information so you can find the one that actually makes sense. Um, while you were talking too, though, I mean, I, I was talking to Roger Hurst who, um, over at Lycaon and Real Vision um, recently, and he, he and I were talking about geopolitics and markets. And, you know, he's, he's more of a trader guy. And he was telling me that when he talks to me, he thinks in terms of, um, you know, trading is a short twitch muscle and geopolitics feels like a long twitch muscle. And while you were talking there, I feel like you were thinking short twitch. And I was already thinking long twitch because um, there's, a, there's two other sort of bigger things, I think, in the coal story that are interesting to me. The first is that apparently the Chinese government had pushed for the biggest miners to consolidate control over the sector. And so a lot of this increase in the coal that's being mined is either from smaller miners or from these bigger miners who are only mining the low quality ore because it doesn't make sense for them. They're not making money um, if they're actually going in and getting that much coal supply on the market. So weird how you sort of get market forces as they're developing and also how you know the Chinese government sets one goal and then underneath it, all these wildcatters at the bottom start challenging it. Like there's a little real estate metaphor in there to me too. Um, but the second point there, and this is the sort of coup de grace of the article, is that you know the more coal prices go up, the more China's basically ensuring the demise of coal in general. Because now coal, you know, coal's big virtue is supposed to be that it's cheap relative to renewables and other things. And what's happening in the dynamics in China right now is that it's not cheap. Nobody's going to be making money in this sense. And all the steps that China is making to ensure energy security this year, which maybe looks a little bit tenuous, will in some ways you know, underscore the argument for the energy transition, not just from a top down, the Chinese Communist Party says it must be so, but also from the point of view that, well, if coal is going to be more expensive, it's not really kind of worth it anyway. So I think what it, it's, it's like the same story with China. If you can metabolize this crisis and get to the broad sunlit uplands of the future, maybe things look good, but probably there's just three other crises waiting for you in the sunlit uplands that I'm not thinking of, you know? Well, I guess two thoughts on that. First, this provides some context around understanding why they've been so aggressive in mm. building out renewable capacity. So we've spoken recently about their investment in solar PV, mm. uh, photo photovoltaic cell production, where capacity, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, was up 150% over the prior year, and now it's expected to double again in the next two years. Yeah. I mean, that's extraordinary growth. And this is already becoming an issue because with the IRA, not the Irish Republican Army, of course, uh, with the IRA uh, program in the U.S., you know, the notion that you're going to get solar cells that are U.S. sourced is increasingly remote because China is basically dominating this this industry and that's also an issue in europe increasingly people are starting to talk about that um in france and, and germany um but it does provide some context because when you talk about energy transition when you talk about sort of the race to acquire and secure low-cost energy and the advantages that confers on you i mean this is a this is a problem if they're if, if this is correct about the coal, um, and it suggests that they're probably going to, you know, double down even more on um, mm. solar and, and all those things because, and, and it provides a bit of a logic to why we're seeing such an extraordinary push into that area. Um, the other observation I would just make is, you know, talking about going from crisis to crisis and um, metastasizing, uh, 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 you know, the things over and over you know this is this is the way that the that system works um when markets are you know interfered with in this way it's the same thing as the housing um when market prices are not functioning when you're doing things because it's part of the five-year plan then you don't get the natural course correction and so you always overshoot in a major way and then you have to you know create a new five-year plan that does something drastic in the other direction so there's a there's a little bit of you know this is by design um or un unavoidable by design um so in that vein 
expect a massive bubble in solar cells, I guess is the, the takeaway. Wouldn't the, uh, isn't the United States guilty of that too, though? Because I mean, if you take out the COVID blip, aren't we like, I mean, COVID obviously sent markets down and it's hard to really account for that effect and all the fiscal stimulus and things like that. But we were with the longest bull cycle ever in part because people weren't willing to turn over to the next cycle, right? And I mean, if things are going like you're saying that even with all the problems, the trade war and the, the pandemic and like all the Russia, Ukraine war, all these terrible problems, and yet we're still growing, like inflation's still going up, like all like growth numbers are looking better than people are thinking. Um, I guess what I'm asking, like sort of tongue in cheek there is, hasn't the West sort of given up on the idea that there is going to be a market correction? There really hasn't been a significant one since 2008. And people don't really want there to be one because of the political scars of 2008. Am I overstating it? What are you talking about in the stock market, in the US stock market, or more generally? I think more generally. I mean, the stock market is a symptom of this, but more generally. Yeah. Um, well, I guess those are two different, two different issues. Um, I don't know. I mean, in the U S obviously we've, we've moved, like, if you look at it, it's funny, a lot of the biggest distortions in the U S are because there's not a true market price in something. Mm -hmm. So look at housing, right? Um, there's all sorts of weird subsidies and, um, you know, uh, debt oriented you know, reasons why house prices do what they do. Um, education is another one, you know, uh, higher education prices. Do they really operate based on a market principle or do they operate because there's an incentive never to consider how much you're spending, you know, the $70,000 a year to go to, uh, the, to the little liberal arts college, um, because you get dead and you know all these sorts yeah. of things which obviously people have written all about how the you know, government participation has kind of skewed a lot of that um but but generally speaking i mean i don't know the, the, this is uh, I'm, I'm being banal here but like we have more market forces at work here than than they do there <laughs> i think is the is the uh is the takeaway. But when you talk about a correction in the stock market, you know, that is, that's another issue. And some people will say that, you know, the Fed and the Fed put are a big part of that, avoiding true, you know, market price discovery and things like that. I'm a little more skeptical of that, um, in part because I think you do tend to see these long bull cycles that are followed by long periods of the market just blah for decades and i think we're probably unfortunately heading into one of those low periods which we've seen in the last year or so um but yeah i i see the the argument for both sides there i suppose before we leave this um and this maybe is also a way to make a point about thinking or thinking about thinking which is you know i sit on top of all this and i see it, the china coal article and indian electricity and pakistan and coal and all these other sorts of things and i start to think well i mean coal prices are probably going to go up right this is the red-headed stepchild of the global energy sector it's been completely ignored but it's still responsible for a massive amount of power generation in the world over um but that's probably too simplistic that's just me you know, at a top political level, noticing that everybody seems to be talking about coal this week and concerned about coal from a supply perspective. If you were going to translate that, do you think you would translate that into coal prices going up? Or if we, if you haven't even thought about that, like where, where would you start to diagnose how to translate that sort of macro insight into something that was actually actionable? No, I think your instinct is correct. And we're already seeing the coal prices go up by quite a bit. Um, I think I would expect that that trend would continue um, really until you get substitution into other forms of energy. Because if the quality really is declining, if they need to pull more coal out of the ground just to stay still, you know, sort of a red queen effect, then that's not going to be good for prices. Because at the margin, it's going to cost much more to extract per unit of energy. So um, that seems like a a logical trend and one that we're already seeing the evidence of in the price action, whether that lasts for 
many years, I think is a is a is another question because then you have substitution into solar or other you know sources of energy, nuclear, and how quickly that happens at the margin is sort of where you would want to focus your mm-hmm. your analysis on the demand side. Um, well, let's turn from there and do a little uh, Russia Ukraine war talk before we get back to the Indo Pacific. Uh, It's the one-year anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine war this week. I just did an interview with Real Agriculture about that. Um, I think we're going to cross-post it on this channel. Um, They said they might allow us to cross-post it, so that's cool for listeners too. But um, I don't know. Why why don't I ask you? I mean, I I feel like I've been getting questions about Russia-Ukraine all week just because every reporter is like, oh, it's it's the one-year anniversary. This is the easy question to ask the armchair geopolitical analyst. But why don't we ask the, the market guy, like, does it mean anything to you that it's the one year anniversary? Like how has the world changed? Like, does it, does it mean anything in markets for you that it's a one year anniversary? I'd, I'd be curious to, to know if, if at all the one year mark affects the way you're thinking in any meaningful way. Um, I guess what I would say is it's extraordinary how quickly people adjust to new environments. First of all, um, I don't think there's a huge focus on the Russia-Ukraine war, at least in the investment community. Mm -hmm. The people that I talk to every day are much more concerned about earnings than battlefield developments. And, you know, maybe that's just human nature or maybe it's uh, a sign of complacency. There's certainly elements of that where something just rumbles on in the background. It's easy to to ignore or forget about it. Um, Like, for instance, we've talked recently about wheat prices have completely round tripped back to where they were pre-war does that reflect some complacency seems like it um so there's there's that element of it as well but i i think another element is um just the war i think as a symbol and a recognition of the fragmentation the lack of um the lack of smooth uh communication of uh, ideas and products across the world that we became so used to um, and just rising friction. I think it's a, it's a big symbol of that. Um, and it's not the biggest cause it's, it, you know, that was in place before the war broke out, but it is a reflection and a, and a manifestation of that. And to the extent that the war continues, which according to, you know, your great interview with Sim last week, it looks like it's uh, bound to continue for at least the medium term, then it's a sign that that those issues are going to be with us for a very long time. Yeah, it's um, it's funny you say that because there's also that, that, uh, that notion that the world really has changed and that it's it's the you know we've been talking about the high water mark of globalization for a while but that the war i think really when we look back in history i think the war will be the moment where people say okay that phase of globalization ended even if some of the data was already beginning to turn even if you had the trade war and stuff like that before i think in some ways this is the point of no return and i mean this is not related to the war in sort of any meaningful way but when you start looking at what you know, what was happening in the U.S. from a policy perspective this week, aside from Biden going to visit Kiev, which I'll talk about in a second. I mean, you had a group of U.S. senators uh, request that the United States reimpose steel tariffs on Mexico on the basis of national security, yeah, because Mexico is really threatening U.S. national security. I, I won't editorialize that. You had a big announcement um, from the United States government about how they're going to become the semiconductor champion of the world, not just relocating supply chains from China, but South Korea and Japan and everything else, how they're going to use those billions in the CHIP Act to try and build up Intel and Micron and NVIDIA and all these others. You have announcements from companies like MP Materials that are saying, we're going to provide all the rare earths for Japanese companies. Um, So they don't have to go through China anymore if they need rare earths. So a U.S. mine starting to produce rare earths and things like that. You also had AMLO come out this week and and he warned that he was going to nationalize the lithium industry in Mexico. He's now like directing the government. All right, like I told you to nationalize it. Why are we not doing it sort of thing? And when you get the, you know, this idea that the United States is leading the charge away from globalization, even in the context of the war, I, I think that that's that sort of dovetails exactly with what you were thinking about and is an unintended consequence of it all. Um, well, I'll pause there and let, cause I, I see you nodding. Do you want to say something there or should I move on to the, the next point? 
No, I'm uh, not really. I get. I guess the only thing I would add is, um, you know, I think it was Keynes who wrote um, in his analysis of the post World War One, um, uh, you know, the consequences of the peace, um, that there was a period where you could sit in your bed in London and order stuff from all over the world and have it arrive on your doorstep and communicate all over the world. Um, and that's a very uh, poignant change reading the accounts of that time. And uh, Last Waltz in Vienna, I think, is a great book mm. about that time. And um, uh, also uh, The World of Yesterday, you know, that kind of literature about a certain openness closing and closing the door on, on, a, on a period of time. And I, I think you get the same feeling today, like as a silly thing, like I have a, a list of all the stocks that I look at the charts of and all the ETFs and things like that. And uh, Russia is, is on my list still. And you just, you click it in and there's just, it's just crickets Nothing. and you can't, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not lit up anymore. And that's the first little sign that things have changed. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I'll be going. I I've, I've been to Moscow a couple times now and loved Moscow as a city. Um, and it took me a couple times of going to Moscow to even feel comfortable kind of being there at all. And I feel like I, I don't think I'll be back in Moscow anytime soon. And it's a shame. It's a you know the world is a beautiful place, and when it gets closed off, it's depressing. But um, I also just wanted to pick up what you were saying about complacency um, because I do think there is a lot of complacency, and it's not just in financial markets, and in some ways. I think this is the biggest threat to Ukraine right now going forward. So there was an Associated Press um, poll that found that just 48% of Americans are now in favor of providing weapons to Ukraine. That's down from 60% in May of 2022. Uh, even more shocking to me was that um, more people in the United States are opposed to sending government funds to Ukraine. So 38% are against sending funds to Ukraine than in favor, 37%. And I think Biden, Biden is, um, I think Biden thinks of himself as a statesman. He's been involved in U.S. foreign policy for, what, four decades now. In some ways, he was trained to be a president during a foreign policy crisis like this. You can debate sort of all of his other foibles and things like that. But at least when it comes to foreign policy, like the dude has experience and has been through a crucible for that sort of thing. But in some ways, I think the visit to Kiev uh, was a little, I don't want to say desperate, but he's up there saying that he, you know it's critical that there not be any doubt about U.S. support for Ukraine in the war. But there is doubt. The White House was leaking just last week that U.S. support was not going to be indefinite. Then you look at those poll numbers. It's not like Biden going to Kiev is going to do anything to make Americans think, oh, it's good that he's sending another half billion over there to Ukraine while you know East Palestine is going crazy and all these problems are in the United States and inflation seems to be sort of having another leg. Um, so I, I think it's a dangerous time in the war for Ukraine because, I mean, you alluded to what Sim said, Russia's doing terribly, but the one, the one thing Russia has done in its conflicts throughout its history is it outlasts you. It out endures you. It's willing to take more pain than anybody else's. And they think Ukraine is an existential conflict. Just look at Putin's speech this week, you know, the state of the Kremlin speech that he gave this week. He's, he doesn't sound like a dude that is about to give up. And if Ukraine could just sit there and pick off these Russian offensives with an unending supply of Western ammunition, you know, things would probably be fine. But if I was Zelensky and I'm looking at the poll numbers and I'm looking at the way political winds are shifting, I'm going to start worrying to your point that people are complacent, that if people don't care that much about Ukraine in the long term, that they're not listening to the fact that he wants to go get Crimea back and all of Donetsk and all of Uhansk. They want some sort of frozen conflict again. And maybe You'll start getting Western pressure on Ukraine to sort of give up. And I think that I think it puts Ukraine in a dangerous position because they they have to have Western support. Um, if they don't have the ammunition, if they don't have the aid, like eventually Russia's advantages in terms of numbers and things like that will probably start to assert themselves. And I just worry that maybe Ukraine is backing itself into a position where Zelensky is going to have to he's going to have to show the West somehow that it's worth continuing to invest in Ukraine. I think you see that with the anti-corruption purges and things like that, that he's doing in Ukraine itself. Um, but he's also probably going to need more than that on the battlefield to also show that, Hey, like these goals that I have of taking back Crimea, they're realistic. I can do it. Just give me the weapons and we'll get the job done. Like that's one argument. The, the argument, Hey, just give us tanks for the next five years. Like 
it, you, the, the U.S. median voter is already telling you that's probably not going to be a thing that Washington is going to sign up for. So um, I don't know. I, I'm that, that's not a particularly sanguine point of view, but I do think there's this sort of race against time for Ukraine that they have a window here with Western support where maybe they can assert themselves, um, but maybe maybe just maybe that window is starting to close, and maybe that creates some desperation, or maybe both sides just you know camp out and and see who can out endure the other but in a conflict like that you would think russia russia would do better so and do you think that the window is shorter now than it used to be because attention spans are definitely shorter i mean we see that in our day-to-day business um just getting people to pay attention to something even if it's very much in their interest and relevant to something that concerns them is a struggle um and uh, it always seemed like that was the big weakness and and that um authoritarian regimes kind of learned that um that the way to beat the united states is to get us to be bored with whatever (laughs) whatever the conflict is and uh it doesn't bode well for for ukraine honestly because those numbers of you know rising people supporting disengagement you know is it is it tangible to them how many of them know where ukraine is how many of them care i don't i don't know even in france it's a it's a similar phenomenon as we've discussed and that's physically much much closer but it feels very far away well in some ways it's yeah i mean in some ways france is further away from Russia in that sense. Like I know that it's closer geographically, but I think the United States has more invested in Eastern Europe than even France does. Um, So that kind of makes sense. But yeah, I mean, I, I sort of take your point. I was shocked at those, those figures from, from the Associated Press in part because anecdotally they don't match up with my experience. I still in, in the very circles that I run in, I still see a lot of support for Ukraine and it's, it's across the aisle. When I go to rural Georgia and I hang out with the people there, they're still, you know, fuck Russia, fuck Putin, like let's support the Ukrainians. And I still see Ukrainian flags being flown in like downtown New Orleans in the quarter of Mardi Gras. People have got their like, you know, Ukrainian flags out as well. So maybe there's something the polls sort of aren't getting attention on. We also, I mean, the Republicans tried this in the mid uh, in the midterms in November. They tried out some of this Ukraine messaging, and things didn't go particularly well for them. So maybe we're underselling it. Maybe there will be something that changes. Um, I also think one place to really watch this is the is the Russia Ukraine grain deal, uh, because I I just said this on, on the Real Agriculture interview. I think people are expecting because last year didn't go as badly as it could have that maybe this year is just going to go fine. And this gets to your point about wheat prices. And there's a I can make the argument for that. Russia talked about leaving the grain deal, I think it was November, December of last year, and the level of anger, not from the United States and Europe, but from places like Brazil and Egypt and Pakistan, all these places that Russia has been prioritizing from a diplomatic perspective as they move away from the West, they're the ones that get hit by the grain deal not being in place. And they were going to Moscow and saying, nope, like that's not going to work. And you saw Russia kind of pivot very quickly. Um, now, you know, there's they're in negotiations again to extend the grain deal. I think it's supposed to expire March 18th. Ukraine's talking about wanting to add more ports and extend it from 120 day extension to a full year extension. Um, is Russia going to go for that? Is Russia going to try and use the food leverage thing again over the West to push on that apathy that you're talking about? Are they appropriately chagrined that the rest of the world will start to turn against Russia if they do try to turn the screws Um on on the grain deal is turkey going to be so distracted by its elections and its earthquake situation that it's not going to play the same sort of stabilizing diplomatic role that it did in negotiating the grain deal there's just um there's a lot of uncertainty there and to your point it might all go fine but i think people are taking for granted that it's going to go fine and they aren't seeing that there are a lot of landmines between sort of here and the summer and sort of the black sea being open as it was before so there, there's a, a tangible way in which this in which we might get some indication about where the direction of this conflict is going to go and how it's going to affect the world. And let me ask you, what leverage do places like Egypt or Turkey have over Russia to force them to reconsider? I think the the answer to that is that the places that have leverage are probably more, well, I'm, I'm guessing here, a place like India or china has more leverage 
because Russia is not able to sell its energy products anymore to Europe. That seems pretty clear. And it's places like India, like China, that have been making up for that and allowing the Russian economy to continue. I, I wouldn't even say limping on. They're doing much better than I, most observers expected, much more than I expected as well. Um, so I think there's that. There's also just, I don't think it's any one, like Egypt does not have leverage over Russia. Brazil does not have leverage over Russia. South Africa doesn't have leverage over Russia. But if all of them get pissed off, if all of them sort of signal, hey, like you can't, if you start doing that, we're going to criticize you. Like we're not going to be as helpful as we were before. I would imagine that that affects how the Kremlin thinks. Um, I was, for instance, I was, I thought it was extremely telling that around this time last year when Russia was getting cute about the grain deal again, that Narendra Modi criticized Russia openly and criticized Putin openly, sort of, I would say, I humiliate is, is a little strong, but like he was willing to go after Russia for the Ukraine war a little bit. Um, with his rhetoric in a way that you wouldn't have expected with India, which is very pragmatic and is importing all the Russian commodities that commodities that they possibly want. So the ironic thing is that, you know, these countries that will turn a blind eye, I don't want to say turn a blind eye because then in some ways they're dependent on the commodities that Russia is exporting, but countries that are not willing to sacrifice their own self-interest for what's going on in Ukraine, if suddenly ag exports are going to zero because of the war, I mean, that starts to affect a lot of the world in, in in a significant way. And if enough of that critical mass starts to push back against Russia, I think Russia maybe sees complete and total isolation. And then that's the negative scenario. So that's a long winded way of saying the individual countries don't have any leverage. But if Russia pulls the food card, it's not individual countries it has to worry about. It's literally everybody else in the world. Um, and you can't be fighting in Ukraine, a full on military war. You're not going to be friends with Europe and the United States anytime soon. And you're going to drive up food prices for everybody else in the world. Like that's, that's a recipe for isolation. And I don't think the Russian economy can survive isolation. Like they have to ship their products somewhere. That's my best attempt to answer that question. I guess the counter argument would be that Putin is very cynical and will assume he can do it and get away with it or that they're more likely to pull the food card as you know they retreat further into the turtle shell of you know great patriotic war and you know uh, it, as things get worse in other words but i don't know if that's true unfortunately we're going to find out um before we turn away, um, I don't know how much we've done on the podcast about this issue in general. I can't remember ever really going at it hard, but why don't we why don't we spend a little bit of time to talk about the Philippines, which has suddenly become a very interesting geopolitical country. Um, this week, the news is number one that they ratified the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is a free trade agreement that comprises most of the Asia Pacific, including China. Um, apparently. Uh, President uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Um, was skeptical about it, but after his trip to Japan last week, he kind of did an about face on it and was cool with it. Um, that's interesting because China's part of that free trade agreement. It's a much less ambitious free trade agreement than, say, what the TPP was or or some of these others. It's really just about trade. It doesn't go into you know labor reforms and um, human rights, like all that stuff. Sort of gets left aside. It's just a trade agreement. But China's in it. It's it's if the more countries that are part of that the less China is isolated in Asia. But at the same time, you've got the Philippines Coast Guard saying they're considering, you know, joint naval patrols with the U.S. Navy in the South China Sea. And um, the question I probably get most often when I'm doing speeches or talking about, geopolit uh, talking about geopolitics publicly is, do you think China's going to invade Taiwan? And I just, I always say, I don't think China's going to invade Taiwan. I'm much more scared of an accidental conflict springing up around the Philippines sort of 2012 Scarborough Shoal type incident, except in this current geopolitical context. Now, all that said, though, um, you know, there was this report from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> I loved the headline here. It was, United States is going to quadruple its troop presence in Taiwan over the next year to combat against China. Uh, so we'll be going from roughly 30 military advisors on the ground to, I believe, 120. Um, I'm joking a little bit, but, um, and I said this in the knowledge platform, the trickle in Vietnam also started with a small number of military advisors. Um, and I, I hate to invoke the memory of Viet Vietnam every time we're talking about a potential U.S. conflict. There are other models of conflict, too. I mean, the Korean War is another example of the United States you know, saying one thing and then when push came to shove, doing another. Um, but I will say that in the long term, it makes me uncomfortable 
if the United States is going to do this dance where nothing has changed with its policy towards Taiwan, and yet there are military advisors on the ground, and you're doing you know patrols in the South China Sea with suddenly a Philippines that is looking like it's choosing a side a little bit more than it was even three months ago. So all of that to say, watch the Philippines in the short term, but also watch the number of military advisors that are present in Taiwan, a country that the United States doesn't even recognize as a country technically. And you had written some interesting comments on the knowledge platform about a high ranking US military official when asked, <clears throat> would the US defend Taiwan in the case of an invasion that he was very wishy-washy about it. He didn't really say yes, he didn't really say no, and you pointed out how dangerous that kind of language is. I wonder, can you just tell us more about that and how that plays in? Because I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, there are there are virtues to strategic ambiguity. Sometimes it's a good idea from a strategic perspective not to be clear about what you're going to do, uh, but sometimes that can also be really, really bad. Um, I and if anybody's listening to this and has perspective on this, please feel free to write in and let me know. I don't think the United States knows what it would do if China were to attack Taiwan. Certainly, at a, if, if it's five years from now and they continue modernizing at the pace that they're modernizing and they could make the conflict that much more costly for the United States, you know, that's a whole other question too. Um, I think it's dangerous for the United States to be doing these things and talking up China as the big boogeyman but yet not being very clear about what its commitment is to Taiwan in general. Just look at the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, the United States was actually very clear about what it was going to do. Absolutely nothing. Like this time last year, Biden was not going to Kiev to stand shoulder to shoulder with Zelensky. He was ordering the withdrawal of most U.S. diplomatic staff from the country and moving the embassy from Kiev to Lviv because he said the United States is not going to put boots on the ground to defend Ukraine. Now, that might be part of the reason why Russia invaded Maybe the threat of having boots on the ground would have led to some kind of deterrent with Russia. I don't think so. I think they probably would have done it anyway. But you know, you can make the argument that, oh, but the United States needs to have you know military presence in Taiwan to act as a deterrent, but it can't actually say that it's going to deter because that ruins the whole one China policy diplomatic fiction that allows like globalization to work and, and US-China relations to work. Um, but it just puts you on a very difficult path. And this goes back to um, the start of the Korean War, which the Korean War is terribly named. It was the first U.S.-China War. It started as a, as a conflict where North Korea, with Soviet support, not with Chinese support, Mao didn't want any part of this. It was the Soviets who egged this on. Um, the Soviets egged on the North Koreans to go take over South Korea, in part because Dean Acheson and the Truman administration left South Korea out of the U.S. Um, you know, security perimeter in East Asia. So they thought maybe they could just waltz in and take South Korea. The United States intervenes, fights the, the Soviet-backed North Koreans back, not just to the border, but all the way to the Yalu River. And then, um, you know, U.S. gets delusions of grandeur and there's, you know, a lack of clarity about what's going on on the ground. And is the United States going to push into China? There were very strong political voices in the United States pushing for that as well. And then suddenly for the next three years after that first three to four months of the conflict, you have Chinese soldiers and U.S. soldiers fighting each other to a stalemate in the middle of the Korean peninsula. peninsula. All of which is to say you can get wars where neither side wants to be in the war and where both sides have said that they don't want to be in the war. But if you're if you have that ambiguity about where you're going to deploy, like you can sort of get into that type of scenario. And the difference is China in 1950 is not China of 2023 or China of 2026 or 2028 if they continue to modernize at that pace. Um, this is a much more kind of serious situation. And um, the last thing I'll just say is that if China gets to the point where it has the capability to go after Taiwan and makes the decision to go after Taiwan. I mean, unless the entire region is going to, is going to band up and, and try and fight them off. I mean, China's probably going to have more invested in taking Taiwan than the United States is going to have, um, you know, political will to stay there. Just look at the poll numbers from Ukraine today. We don't even have boots on the ground and people don't want to send Ukraine financial aid, 38% of Americans opposed to it more than those that support it. So just imagine that in, in a Taiwan conflict. So, I'm rambling there a little bit, but it doesn't seem to me that strategic ambiguity when it comes to Taiwan is a good thing. Um, it's one thing if the United States wants to defend Taiwan, there's all sorts of reasons from both an ideological and strategic perspective that makes sense. Say it, do it, like rip the bandaid off and start preparing. And if you're not going to do it, um, I'm sorry to be so callous and cold hearted here, but if you know you're not going to do it, 
um, there's a conversation to be had there with China behind the scenes where you could maybe get some things from China as concessions if you're willing to sort of talk about that. Um, China is the only reason the Russian economy is propped up. If you know you're not willing to defend Taiwan, you want to pick China away from Russia and build China into the into the into a U.S. led order again. Like I'm, I'm not to be clear, I'm not advocating that. I'm I'm not even making a political situation one way or another. I'm just noting that strategic ambiguity just means we all just sit here playing with our thumbs, saying one thing, dispatching military advisors, and nobody knows what's actually going to happen. That to me seems to be the worst of all worlds where there's no strategy, there's no tactic, there's no what does success look like. That's where you get into sort of conflicts like the Korean War or World War I. World War I was a, a similar sort of thing where everybody thought it was going to be a short mini thing that wasn't going to be that big of a deal. But when you actually looked at all the different relationships and all the dominoes that fell around it, things went bad. So that's why I don't like the, the strategic ambiguity around that, uh, around Taiwan in particular. And do you think that strategic clarity... I guess that's the term, the opposite of ambiguity. If you go out there and say, we're going to do this, this is the red line. Here's what we're going to do in response to these actions. Do you think that that loses its potency when, you know, the U.S.'s adversaries know that we're very politically driven and know that the political situation in the U.S. is not very stable, that we could make promises and then opinion could change and we won't follow the promises, especially for a big thing like a conflict in Taiwan, which would require public support, as you point out. It's not like a little, you know, something that the military alone can decide on with no consequences. Um, what, what do you think about that? Is that, especially, you know, over time as we become more isolationist or, or arguably more wishy-washy in terms of policy, does China feel like they can wait it out? And and also, do those promises mean anything anymore? I would think that China's plan is to wait it out. Um, and you know, as we're seeing with the Russia-Ukraine war, to, to a certain extent, if a country decides it needs to do something, like no amount of deterrence is going to, especially if they've convinced themselves from a national security perspective, it's, it's as existential in the case of Ukraine as Putin convinced himself it was. You know, no amount of deterrence is really going to turn you away. You have to have some idea for the prospect of success. My argument against worrying about a Chinese invasion of Taiwan over the next five years is because I don't think they can, I don't think they can imagine doing that and pulling it off successfully. And I don't think China will um, go down that route unless it has some idea about success. And that, in that sense, China is a little more sober, I think, about its capabilities um, than Russia is. But. Yeah, I mean, the, the honest answer to your question is, and you know, it's very easy for me sitting here in New Orleans at my desk to talk like this cavalierly. For all I know, in, inside the US government, uh, there is a plan and they do know exactly what they're going to do. But to uphold one China, they can't sort of say that publicly. Maybe they've given assurances behind the scenes to Taiwan and I'm just not privy to the things that are happening. I'm just saying that from, from where I'm sitting right now, when you sort of look at all the developments that are happening with the US... Um, in Taiwan in particular, in the Philippines, like it's just not clear to me that um, that the United States knows exactly what it's going to do. China's going to do what it's going to do anyway. And I think China's going to try and do to Taiwan exactly what it did to Hong Kong. It's going to try and have political and economic influence there until it's a fait accompli. Uh, but we're not the UK. Like <laughs> when, when the fait accompli comes, like we usually don't just turn around. We usually take it as a challenge and double down and mess some stuff up. And then eventually we go home having done the same thing. I'm just hoping we can skip that part of the equation this time. And last question, do you think that if the Philippines is signaling that they're moving closer into the U.S. orbit or trying to, you know, uh, engage with us militarily more, and as you pointed out in the past, one of China's big hopes was to sort of pry the Philippines away from the U.S. security circle around China, you know, as that map shows that you always like to show China's view of the world where they're literally encircled by U.S. allies. If that shows signs of probably not happening and the Philippines moves in the opposite direction, how does that change, if at all, uh, China's approach or, or actions? This is a long game. So if we were talking three years ago, we'd say China was doing well. Uh, the Philippines could have a coup and you know, somebody else takes power that becomes more pro-China. 
Um, so it's a setback for China. In some ways, it, it makes China more isolated, I think, in the short term. Um, it makes China have to emphasize relationships with maybe Indonesia and Malaysia more. Maybe they start to look at South Korea as the weak link in the U.S. You know, security perimeter rather than the Philippines. Um, maybe they just get back to sort of, hey, let's just do growth and globalization here for another couple of years, and then we'll try our hand at this wolf warrior stuff again down the line. So just because one Philippine president's making a couple moves over you know, the course of a couple months, like I don't want to I don't want to outplay it. Um, I'll just say that, you know, China's invested a lot in the last 10 years and seem to be having some success in changing um, what the Philippines was doing. And it's just not. And that goes to the bigger story about, I mean, China just can't win right now. Everywhere you look with China, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's the economy, like it's basically all problems. And you can sort of imagine if they can get through these problems, may, maybe things get a little better, but just nothing that China is doing seems to be working right now. And that's the real point of that map when I show it to audiences. When you're thinking about what China's going to do over the next three to five years, um, it's not like a Russia, hey, we're going to invade Kiev and you know, we're a great power, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's much more um, circumspect. It's defensive. It's reactionary. It's we have to do these things in order to survive right now. We have this long-term perspective where eventually we'll get there, but we have the stuff that we need to deal with right now and defend ourselves right now. So that's i think that's how i would answer that question but um yeah i i i don't 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 assume that just because things haven't been going well uh, with the philippines for china right now that they think it's it's um that their strategy has been unsuccessful i think the bigger challenge for china in general um and which doesn't have to do with the military patrols in taiwan and all the sexy stuff that makes headlines and i alluded to this before um you know the philippines changed its mind on that trade deal after Marcos went to Japan. And when you start looking at what Japan is doing in the region, whether it's strengthening its military or investing um, in dual use technologies, or when you look at you know Japan's infrastructure investments in Southeast Asia versus China's much ballyhooed Belt and Road, um, you know, the Japanese um, are, are more than a worthy competitor right now for China in a lot of these different areas. Um, and that I think is maybe the part of the story that is also going left untold. We think we're trying to, th the, the media wants to think of this in U S China cold war 2.0 terms. Uh, and Japan is sitting right there doing a lot of interesting things that I don't think people are, are paying enough attention to. Yeah. People always forget, you know, Japan is much smaller than China, obviously. But it's also a nation of 120 million people with a, you know, GDP per capita that's nearly at U.S. levels, and with a huge incentive to act more directly against Chinese influence in the region. So, when you look at China's actual, you know, resources they can marshal, and it's easy to look and say, "Oh, it's a nation of 1.2 billion people. How could Japan ever stand up against those guys?" But yeah, they can, um, at least right now. Well, that, that's an interesting point to close on, and maybe we'll do a whole episode just on this. But I've been thinking more about Japan in general. Number one, because I'm trying to put together our country profile for Japan on the knowledge platform. And I had to put together some thoughts for for Lycan on Japan earlier this week, too. And um, I, I went back and I was reading some, some Japanese history. And you know, Japan, like when you talk about geopolitical constraints, it has all of them. They have terrible demographics. They have absolutely no resources. Um, they are completely dependent on China from an economic perspective. Their biggest trade partner right now is not the United States. It's China. It's something like 20, I, I can't remember what's, what's imports and what's exports, but between 20 and 25% of imports and exports go to China. Uh, and yet when you look at like, that's been true of Japan since the Meiji restoration, like on paper, if you just look at the geopolitical constraints, Japan should not be a great power. It has none of the things necessary to become a great power in terms of resources that had to overcome all of those constraints. And if you look back before the Meiji Restoration from like literally the 1100s to the 1800s, they weren't a power. They were just a way station for pirates and then a bunch of samurai swinging swords at each, at each other. And that was it. So there's a version in which Japan goes back to that sort of really messy, chaotic, not coherent focused way. Like there's almost a millennium of, of Japan doing that sort of thing. Um, but I say that to say also, I think people also talk a lot about China's constraints because yes, they have to import energy now too. And yes, they can't grow enough food. And yes, there's a lot of pollution. And yes, they're also 
getting old in a certain way. Japan, I think, is a really great reminder for like geopolitics is not just lay out some constraints and then go have a beer. Because if it were, A, it'd be really easy, and B, Japan wouldn't be a great power. Japan is a great um, example of how you know here's a country that has all the constraints um, arrayed against it and overcame them all out of some kind of hard to describe political cohesiveness that allowed them to extend beyond it. And the point I'm making there is twofold. It's number one, I think Japan's at that moment again. So everybody's counting them out because of the demographics. I don't know. The last two times they had these types of moments, they literally changed the world with how they overcame things in a creative way. And the broader point there is also just because China has a bunch of constraints, just because you know a country like India or something like that has a bunch of constraints, the really hard part of geopolitics is not identifying the constraints. That's the easy part. The, the hard part of geopolitics is what country has... Um, intangible resources to overcome or sort of innovate out of those constraints that at least from a, you know, on paper should prevent them from becoming a great power. Um, so yeah, I, I went off and ranted there, but I, I think in many ways, Japan is, is, um, aside from just thinking about Japan as being as competitive in this part of the world as China and thinking about it in multipolar terms rather than just us China terms. It's also, even when you're thinking about China, the lesson of Japan and how Japan has evolved geopolitically over the last 150 years is really, really important today. Well, you know, it goes to one of the key principles of geopolitics that you always talk about. And honestly, one of the reasons why I think you are a particularly good geopolitical thinker is because you're so well-rounded because geopolitics is about humans. You know, it's not just constraints. It's about societies and their psychology and how they organize themselves and how people think as it's a humanist pursuit at the end of the day and um you know the japan example is a great one because you know everyone is always afraid of china as you point out but historically like china are, the chinese are known as the laid-back ones they're known <laughs> as sort of the, the fun ones you know the entrepreneurial kind of shopkeeping society the japanese pardon my French, are fucking terrifying as far as, like, look at look at their dedication to anything and how intense of a society they are. And, this, you know, uh, we can get into this, it's a longer discussion, obviously, but just understanding those elements and how they play I think is so important, and you can't you can't ignore it. But yeah, I'm, I would be, I would definitely be on the same uh, the same side as you, that people are underestimating Japan and their ability to do things especially when fear is an element. Fear focuses minds, and you could make an argument that that's part of the reason why Japan has been such a huge success over the last 150 years is because they were the most afraid. Mm. Yep. Well, on that, on that inspiring, uplifting <laughs> note, uh, I guess we'll say goodbye and uh, see you all next week. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.